So there's an assumption that there's not enough women in STEM. I know that is incorrect because I'm in STEM and my name is Latina Rivers. So let me say it again. There's an assumption that there's not enough women in STEM and that's incorrect because I know, because I'm in it. And then there are a lot of other women that are in STEM too. Why do we choose STEM? Because STEM gets us. It gets us because it inspires us to design, to create, to innovate. And in that process, we grow, and it creates a higher visible platform for us. So it's not about us not having the wrong sex and just the right stuff. No, we have it all. And today, I'm gonna to tell you about why it's important that we really look at how we talk about STEM and how we tell that story. Because if you don't tell the story correctly, it can create a narrative that is very dangerous and deceptive. So, when we're talking about STEM, we need to identify it as science, technology, engineering, and math. And when we're looking at it, we really wanna know how many women are actually in STEM itself and what are they doing? Well, here's what the data says. The data says it's about even. It's about maybe 49, 50% worth of women going to get a science or engineering degree. That's pretty different. It's probably something you haven't even heard of. Well, let's go even further. Let's look at the distribution of what we have going on in STEM. You see that engineering has been pretty steady. It's about 18, 19% and then mathematics is about 25, 26%. And then just recently, physical sciences has fallen off for women, but it's 3%, it's okay, it's okay. We'll get it back, it's negligible. And then as it goes on, the social sciences and the, and the physical sciences or the life sciences in this particular case will have a higher amount. What does that look like for our percentage for workforce development, just dealing with women? Well, as you can see, engineering is still at 20%. But your social sciences and your biologists, they're pretty close off the chart. So what is it that they do in those sciences that we are not doing in engineering? Or in particular, certain aspects of engineering, maybe aerospace, electrical, computer science, something of that sort. There's a key in there. This is what our workforce is looking like today. There's about a 4% gender gap between men and women. So there's plenty of women in the workforce. But as you go down, you will see that the STEM degrees awarded overall picks up steadily, 22%. And then the workforce itself, like women actually out there working and things of that nature, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty dismal. Is that 24? But somebody may argue, oh my gosh, that's 24% of STEM. That's almost half of the women's workforce. Yeah, but I don't, I don't accept that at all. I don't accept that, and nor should you. So what we should do is focus on how to get more women in engineering, not the sciences of biology and chemistry, but into engineering in particular. And some have been successful with that, in particular the interdisciplinary fields of it. So your biomedical engineering, your biotechnology, your industrials, your systems, women, women are there. They're in chemical, they're in mechanical. They're just not quite in aerospace. But we can fix that and all along while we keep the question of why going. Originally, before we lifted off, we had a prototype program where we took male test pilots and said, we want to go to the moon because we're America and we don't like being second best to anybody else. There was 32 participants in that male study. Only 18 of them really passed it. Here it is. We had a pilot program for women. It was 19 of them, and 13 out of that 19 was successful. So then this Brigadier General in 1959 said, it would be more practical to send women to space than men because of the payload, so the weight, the cost of all of that. Was he onto something? Perhaps, but most people weren't buying it. They were like, it's a female, she can't go, she can't do that. She's supposed to sit at home and raise kids and be pretty. If we had to follow this Brigadier General's advice in 1959, then we would probably have a class of more than 100 women astronauts. Right now, we're sitting about at 58. But NASA, gotta love NASA. 
they don't accept the status quo. They break barriers. And how do they do it? By inclusion. And when that's what they did, when they integrated the space program in the early 60s, when race tensions was high, it worked. And they've done it now again. Half of our astronaut class is 50% of women. That's like a big deal, considering women didn't get into the space program until late 1970s, early 1980s with the shuttle program. It's a big deal to have four women that are astronauts. So, like I said, the idea that women aren't in STEM or there's not enough of us is misleading. We need to focus once again on engineering. And how do you do that? You have to create outreach because it creates a visible platform that will better us all with literacy, with diversity, with development, and so forth. So what we have here is Samantha Christopher Reddy. She's a Space Camp alum. Woo, go Space Camp. Yes. <laughs> OK, so she came to Space Camp. And if you don't know about Space Camp, well, I'm about to tell you, because it's freaking awesome. It was started in 1982, so Space Camp's 33 years old. Technically, it's a millennial, so don't, don't judge it too hard. Um, but it's off the premise of Warner Von Braun that there should be a camp for people that wanted to learn about science, technology, engineering, and math. Just so happened here at Space Camp, they let you do that, regardless of your gender or race. They remove the constructs of it. So we crack the cosmic egg of a trainee that comes in. We tell them, this is really what an engineer does. This is really what it looks like. All along, continually answering the question of why is it important? Because we need you. Because this is workforce development that will sustain us. Other tactics that you could use is emerging technology. We know that it works. We live in an information age. We don't live in a space age anymore. Everybody learns through digital. So utilization of STEM and STEAM, so we're throwing in that A for arts, which is highly controversial right now, um, is imperative. Because we use arts every day in our life. Whether you're a mechanical engineer and you are drafting, you have to know what your piece looks like. You have to make it aesthetically pleasing. Is that not something that you do in art class that your teacher would grade you on? Or what about math? and fractions and music. If you can read music, then you should be able to do fractions. So we use a combination of those skill sets along with communication and leadership because you, you gotta be able to talk to somebody. You gotta be able to inspire. And we go forth. And it provides a global exchange of information of diversity. Answering the question of why is this important? Because this is workforce development. This is visibility. This is taking us beyond the stars. And from there, we can preserve our legacy in training the next generation to whether if they want to go into aerospace or they want to go into electrical or computer science or just hang out in the normal quote unquote girl sciences of biology and chemistry and all that, whatever that is. But also, you have to provide support to them. You have to mentor them. If they're going to go to Mars, because Mars is the next big thing for us to go, they have to have that support. So whether it is you seek out traveling field trips that helps bring robotics to your classroom if you don't have the means, or you explore in a different capacity, it is necessitates that we help them. We mentor them. So for instance, those students right there, those were my students. I was an educator, a formal educator, before I became an engineer. I taught via Project Lead the Way. And my students were hilarious because they didn't quite understand how I could be an engineer and a teacher. They was like, no, that don't go together. No, no. That means you're smarter than my normal teacher. No, that doesn't mean I'm smarter than your normal teacher. No, it just means that I chose a different path to come to educate you. And I learn as much from you as you learn from me. So on that premise, let's lift off. Let's do this, OK? And so they really bought into it. They really thought and believed, most importantly, that I was there. And the questions that they would ask were amazing. So the girl in the purple sweater, Lydia. Lydia loved to talk. Lydia was your student that said, Ms. Rivers, 
I quite don't understand how um, ECLIS work. And ECLIS, by the way, is Environmental Control Life Support Systems. I just don't understand. Why would they recycle their urine and water? That's like really gross, Ms. Rivers. Um, <laughs> so I had to tell Lydia, Lydia, you, you just can't go to the bathroom and shuttle up fresh water when you go to different planets, OK? You, you, you got to know how to recycle it. You know how we recycle here on Earth because we have limited resources? It's like that in space. And so I guess when I put it to her like that and I sort of used the gross out factor, she bought into it. She was like, yeah, I want to do that. Can I do that right now? Yes, we're about to do that. Have a seat. Thank you. <laughs> and then from there, I introduced them to STEM toys or STEAM toys. They had no idea. They was like, what? There's a doll that looks like you? Yeah, technically, technically. <laughs> you know, I've got the blonde hair. She's got the blonde hair. She's in overalls. Well, I'm in heels, but it looks good. So they, they didn't know. But the, the thing about it is about visibility and getting the information out there to crack their cosmic egg and to give them the chance because it's all about that why, because they need to feel that they're important, that we need them, and that there's a support system there for them. And most importantly, once we grow up and we become adults, they need to know, especially I need to know, that I can get back into industry if I decide to have a family. Um, I don't feel that it's fair for, as women, that we, we have to decide career over family. Why can't we have it both? I mean, we're told we can have it both, but it doesn't seem that we can have it both. Luckily, there are some programs out there that can facilitate that. And these are some of the key ones. Advise Her is an app, because we live in an information age, and it lets you know about latest and greatest developments and how to navigate and network. Then you have NIH, National Institute of Health. They are there for a research program and reentry for biomedical STEM participants. And then the Society of Women Engineers, which I feel every woman should be a part of, because it's just cool to be a part of it. Um, they have partnered with iRelaunch, and it helps engineers. Whether you are in the field and you want to transition to another side, or you're out because you had to come out for some strange reason, it doesn't matter. The point is, we need to utilize the workforce that we have developed so then the students that you see on the screen can be the sustainable future because we need both. We need it. We need opportunity. We need diversity. We need to value women's opinion and ideas. And most importantly, we need to tell you that there's not a shortage of women in STEM. There's a shortage of women in engineering. And these are some of the concepts that can do it. Because if not, then what are we doing? How are we going to lift off? Thank you. <laughs>